So the last talk this morning will be by Barney Brem Bremham from Bochum, and he will speak about Poincaré's last geometric theorem, a 21st century proof. Okay, thank you very much, and um, it's an honor to be here this week, especially to be able to actually uh, give a talk, so I thank the organizers very much for that. Um, so, so as many speakers have said already the last day or so, uh, Poincaré spent a lot of time thinking about um, motions of planets, especially three. And um, so back in 1912, 100 years ago, I suppose he'd been thinking about them for close to 30 years. And I would like to talk about um, an interesting uh, question that was very influential uh, called, uh, that, that he asked shortly before he died. And um, this question, which he came to from considering the motion of planets, is just a, a question about um, maps on a shape like this. So we have a two-dimensional uh, surface. It looks like a plate with a smaller plate, a sort of hole removed from the middle. And instead of this uh, motion, which was just uh, planets moving under the laws of gravity, we now have uh, a law on our disk, on our, sorry, on our annulus, which says that if I have a point like A, then this law tells me that there's some other point I should move to such as B. And no two points go to the same one, and this is defined for all points and so on. So this whole thing now is called a transformation. And he was particularly interested in configurations of planets that, uh, after a certain amount of time, come back to their original position. Because then these are ones that you can then understand, you know, trivially for all time, and then maybe ones nearby, well, anyway. So he's particularly interested in fixed points of this transformation. So before, I, I won't really explain exactly how this, uh, this annulus map is arrived at, but let me just say for a, a sort of simpler, a, a similar example that I believe he also thought about, and, uh, and Burkhoff also, um, is the following situation. So you have a, a surface, uh, maybe it looks like the surface uh, of an egg, a sphere like this one, and you have a point, a particle, I've made it look like a planet, and it's attached to this. And it's, there's no friction. It's free to move around, but it won't fall off. Maybe there's a magnet or something. And if you give it a, a nudge in any direction, then there's a sort of a natural path that will follow. And then this is called a geodesic, but it will keep going forever, I'd say. And he's interested in the analogous question in this situation for, uh, uh, that he asked about for celestial mechanics would be, is there a curve uh, that is closes up? So. <clears throat> This is a difficult question, and uh, I'd like to just quickly explain uh, an idea that you may use to approach this. And uh, it goes like this. You say, well, supposing I can find one such closed curve. So I have my, my egg, and I manage to find one path. And I say, maybe I examine the other paths that start off from this one. And I see where they go, and maybe if I move around a lot, I find one that closes up. So I take a point, and I take a direction. I don't care about uh, the length of this uh, direction. And I uh, nudge my, my, my particle, and it goes along, and I see what the natural path is. And if I'm lucky, maybe it comes back and intersects the red curve. Let's assume it does. Then on the second time I intersect it, I have a well-defined vector, uh, arrow, based at this red curve, pointing in the same side of the red curve as the first vector. So in some sense, I now have a law which says, <clears throat> if I start off with a vector like this one, then I can produce another one. And I sort of forget about what exactly goes on on the blue curve in between this. And then if you think about it abstractly, the space of all such vectors, we don't care about the length of it. Well, there's sort of a two-dimensional family of them. I can move uh, tangent to the curve, and I only um, uh, to the red curve, and I only care about vectors pointing to one side. And then there's 180 degrees as I sweep out from top to bottom. And I could also change the base point as I go around a circle. So if you think about it for a minute, you actually have something where the natural notion of closeness between these vectors 
gives you something that looks like a closed annulus, so this, this uh, space I, I mentioned a, a minute ago. And now, this rule that says I start off with a vector A and I get a vector B now turns into a rule on the annulus. So I now, if I'm given a point on the annulus such as A, this corresponds to a vector on the left-hand side. I follow the blue path around, it gives me another vector, and that corresponds to another point on the annulus. So now I have a law that says I do move from A to B on the annulus. So now we have two points of view of the same, same situation. And uh, Poincaré did analogously uh, for um, celestial mechanics and for three bodies. And uh, uh, he was interested in, are there paths which close up? And in this case, this would correspond to a point on the annulus which is fixed by the transformation. So he's particularly interested in these. Um, now, what's common to both of these approaches is that uh, what's going on is that there's some three-dimensional space with uh, some arrows on it, a vector field, and you're interested in the motion if you start at a point and you follow these arrows, where do you, do you ever come back to yourself? And in all of these, he's, picked, uh, he's cleverly picked a two-dimensional sort of slice of this, which I'll call a surface of section, which has the nice property that if you start off on a point on this surface, and follow the arrows, you come back to another point on the surface. And this gives you a map on the surface. And in fact, in both those cases, you end up with something that is in some sense uh, an annulus. And I just wanted to mention this now because later on in my talk, uh, we'll show that while these are quite hard to find uh, in general, there's actually uh, uh, ends up a way of using a partial differential equation that allows you to, in some sense, naturally arrive at surfaces of section if you're lucky. And this was where I'll come to. So I just wanted to draw a link between what was going on 100 years ago and what happens uh, a long time later. So back to the story. So Poincaré now has a map of the annulus. He's interested, does this have fixed points? Because this would correspond to some interesting uh, properties of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the planets he's studying. Um, now, he asks himself, what properties of this map um, do I know about? And there are two, two interesting properties. So one is that if you, instead of just considering where a single point goes, you take a set of points, and you consider what happens under the transformation. Well, the set, of course, gets distorted like this cat. But it turns out it'll have the same area. And this is somehow uh, a property or comes from the nature of the uh, laws of motion. And then the second property is that uh, on the two different boundary circles, the points are moving on one circle to, say, counterclockwise, and on, say, the inner circle clockwise, or, or the reverse. But in, nevertheless, in opposite, strictly opposite directions. And then this is often referred to as a twist. So uh, given these assumptions, he, uh, oh yeah, so, so, if, so if I now took a, a set like this, this cat and applied this, I would get a cat of the same area, but now it gets distorted in this fashion. And then by playing around with many examples, <clears throat> he asked if maybe such a map must automatically forget about where it comes from in mechanics, just with these two properties. Uh, I should also say orientation preserving and, and so on. Um, does this map always have a fi two fixed points? So that is like these two red points where the transformation doesn't move them. And if you remove either of these assumptions, you can clearly see that this, this doesn't have to be true. If you ignore area preserving, it's easy to find a counterexample. And if you don't have a twist, it's the same. You could, for example, rotate in the same direction around. So, um, <clears throat> so this is the question he asked. And I believe he managed to answer it in, in a number of um, cases. And I'd like to explain a, a beautiful idea that sort of almost works because then something I'll show later bears some sort of resemblance to this. And the idea is roughly as follows. So supposing I take, uh, so first of all, I, I use the fact that uh, this is twisting the inner boundary one direction and the outer boundary another direction. So supposing I take a straight line that goes from the inner circle to the outer circle. And then I start walking along this line from the inner boundary. So if I start on the inner boundary, clearly the transformation moves me to the right. And if I, as I go further up, it moves me to the left. 
So the image maybe looks like this. Of course, it could be a lot more complicated than this. Um, I'll come back to that. Nevertheless, there must be some point by continuity as I move up that doesn't move either to the, to the right or the left of the line and therefore stays on the line. So there must be some point, like this red one, that moves to some other point on the line, such as this uh, green one. It could be, of course, closer to the center or the same point and so on. Okay. <clears throat> so now I could play the same game with another radial line. So let me take this one. And again, I start from, from close to the center and move outwards. And there must be some point that moves neither to the right nor the left, such as this red one. And it goes to another point. And I can do the same with another line. Maybe this time the red point moves inwards. And then more lines and more lines. And if I do this for all of them, maybe I end up with a picture like this, where I have two circles that are enclosing the central boundary. So I have these two circles, the red one being taken to the, to the, to the green one. And in this example, they intersect. There are, of course, four intersection points here. And of course, if we think about it, what, what, what's special about these intersection points is these are points which stay on the same radial line and go from uh, the red curve to the green curve. So assuming they only intersect once on that radial line, these have to be fixed points. So in this case, we were lucky we even got four fixed points. Uh, he's conjecturing maybe two. Now, why should we have any of these intersection points? So if we can show two intersection points, we're done. So to summarize, we've constructed a red circle and a green circle going around this uh, central boundary. And we would like to show they intersect in at least two points. And then we've uh, proven there are two fixed points. So, so far, we've only used one of the assumptions that there's a twist. We haven't used area preserving. And if we don't use it, something's wrong because the statement is clearly false if you don't use this. So this comes in now. So supposing, by bad luck, we end up with the green circle and the red circle not intersecting. And they must look probably something like this because they have to go around the, the curve, the, the, the boundary. But then, <clears throat> of course, this means that the area enclosed inside the red circle is getting mapped to the, to the region of much larger area inside the green circle. So this is a problem because this map had to be area preserving. And so, of course, we think about it, two regions, <clears throat> two circles which enclose two regions which have the same area have to intersect in at least two points because somehow either they sit exactly on each other or one of them kind of has to come in and then come out again. So you end up with two, two of these intersection points and then these two fixed points. So that's basically the argument. And it's <clears throat> a beautiful argument. Uh, um, of course, one problem with it, with it is right at the beginning is that there need not be these unique points that move neither to the right or the left. And you could then end up with, so actually this, this picture I drew, of course, is actually not, not what could happen because the regions inside are, are not going to have the same area. But uh, I, I only realized this just, uh, I didn't have time to change this. But nevertheless, you can make up configurations that clearly you're not going to have two, two intersection points because of this. So um, a year later, nevertheless, uh, Burkhoff uh, actually found a correct argument <clears throat> or an argument that really works. And um, it's funny, but uh, uh, humans, mathematicians, scientists, uh, I guess uh, everyone, you know, when, when a question is answered, uh, <clears throat> they're rarely satisfied where you just want to know, does, does the answer to the question suggest new interesting possibilities? Uh, um, and, and things like this. And um, I don't know actually um, how Burkhoff's proof was, was used in other directions, but certainly um, uh, what Poincare's ideas, I believe, uh, well, I know in, in inspired um, uh, many people later, and in particular Arnold in the 60s. Um, he made a, conjecture, a number of conjectures that generalized this question about the annulus. And so he managed to make a statement that would include, that, that included spaces of uh, higher than two dimensions and not just uh, shaped like an annulus and so on. 
Personally, if I uh, had been around at the time, I would have put my money on it being a two-dimensional thing. I mean, I'm clearly wrong, but that's what I would have been my gut instinct from the idea that we just looked at. It seems somehow that the twist and the error preserving are somehow accounting for the two of the dimensions. And so uh, I would have been very surprised that this holds in higher dimensions. But Arnold actually finds a, a statement that uh, turns out to be, uh, to be true. So um, now uh, his question <clears throat> is a question in, in symplectic geometry. So it's the geometry of uh, the, the equations of motion. And there's a long story here, and I'm not going to say much about this, except how it relates to what I want to say in the next part of my talk. Um, so in the 80s, <coughs> Gromov then introduced um, uh, a new tool to this, this geometry of the equations of motion. And he showed that uh, solutions to a certain elliptic partial differential equation called pseudomorphic curves in the context of, uh, of, symplec of a symplectic space have uh, uh, wonderful properties. Now, then there's uh, <coughs> this somehow was uh, crucial to uh, answering uh, Arnold's question. So just before Gromov, Ali Ashberg answered the Arnold's conjecture for all two-dimensional uh, uh, surfaces to which it would apply. And then Conley and Zander managed to do all dimensions for a particular class, so tori, all even dimensional tori. So, and then Fleur, <coughs> sort of combining uh, Conley and Zander's ideas and Gromov's, managed to do a substantial chunk of all, of all the spaces. And then there are <coughs> and many other people who also contributed to this. Um, uh, I mentioned just a few. So important, so relevant for, for, for the rest of my talk is that in the 90s, Hoffer, <coughs> uh, uh, Wazowski, and Zander discovered that in a certain uh, framework, these, 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 uh, these pseudomorphic curves actually uh, naturally give you a surface of section if you, for certain uh, Hamiltonian, uh, uh, certain, certain three-dimensional spaces with a sort of Hamiltonian uh, vector field on. Now, in general, you, you, it's not at all clear that even today that you actually have a surface of section coming from this. It's not known for every contact three manifold, for example. But uh, they showed that uh, in, in many cases, sort of how to construct them. And uh, this will be important for what I want to say in a minute. And in fact, using this technology, these pseudomorphic curves and surfaces of section that come from these, it turns out you can go uh, sort of historically backwards and uh, return and actually prove uh, Poincaré's uh, question uh, again. And this is what I like to explain because it has a partic particularly uh, geometric feel to it. And, um, and in some sense, once you, if you assume that you have the existence of these solutions to this equation and so on, then you end up with a picture that's not dissimilar to the one I showed 10 minutes ago. So, so to explain this, I'd like to so, so let's recall what the statement is. So the statement was you have a transformation of, an, of this surface, an annulus, it rotates the boundaries in opposite directions, and it preserves area. So let me reformulate this as a statement for disk maps, just, just for convenience. So now I've sort of essentially shrunk the inner boundary to a point, and I'm saying, OK, I now have a map on the disk. It preserves area. It fixes the origin. And it sends the points on the boundary, in some sense, to the opposite direction to the points infinitesimally close or the linearization at the, um, at the, the origin. And then now your conclusion would like to be two fixed points besides the origin, of course. <clears throat> so now, to apply these pseudomorphic curve techniques, I'd like to re-embed, kind of go backwards, and re-embed the disk in a three-dimensional space with a flow, but now pick the flow to be kind of convenient and the space to be topologically simple. So I'm going to make it look like a, a, a solid torus, so a donut. 
So I have a three-dimensional space here. I'm envisaging putting this disk map in here. And now for the moment, forget that this is a twist map. Just keep it area preserving. So we put it in here. And now we <coughs> reconstruct uh, some sort of vector field on the three-dimensional space so that if I start at a point on the disk, call it P, and I follow the vector field, I go in a curve, and I come back to some other point. I'll call it T of P here on the, on, on the disk. And it's the same map. So fixed points of the map on the disk, of course, correspond to periodic orbits of this flow here that go once around. So in this situation, it turns out that, um, let, oh yeah, let me first open this up. This is kind of more convenient for the next pictures. So I'm just slicing it here and opening it up. Um, <clears throat> turns out that you can actually fill up the whole space by surfaces of section. Now, of course, they're all, they're originally it was filled by surfaces of section that look like all these disk slices are also surfaces of section. But here's uh, ones that are uh, different. They're not topologically disks. These are now uh, annuluses, each of them. <clears throat> so what do we have here? So roughly, we have a filling of the space by surfaces. I've written foliation. Of course, it's really a singular foliation. Um, and this consists of a typical leaf looks like this. So it's topologically an annulus because the boundary here should be identified with the one here. It won't in general. I just drew in my picture. I made it look exactly flat like this. Of course, it's going to wiggle around a lot. Um, and then the rest of the leaves are looking similar. They're all looking like annually. And the relation to the dynamics is that the vector field that we have on the interior of each of these surfaces is strictly, is never tangent to it, so it points always in some direction, that's the red arrows. They, in this case, they point upwards. And on the boundary, they are tangent. So a small caveat is that they don't have to be tangent to the boundary of these curves that lie in the boundary of the three manifold, but that's just a... So in particular, the boundaries of these surfaces, if they exist, um, have to be on... Uh, periodic orbits of this flow on the solid torus, so correspond to fixed points of the original map. And these surfaces come from, these are not pseudomorphic curves, these are in an odd dimensional space, but these are the projection of pseudomorphic curves in a four dimensional space down to this picture here. Um, so, now to explain, supposing we actually have a map that's a twist map. So this thing exists generically. I have a generic error preserving map. Then you can actually get this. Of course, it still doesn't immediately imply necessarily a lot of periodic orbits, because it could be a much simpler looking foliation a priori. Um, so let me take a, a, a slice like this and say, well, we said that the flow is transverse to the leaves in the three-dimensional picture. So lying a little bit, intuitively at least, in the two-dimensional slice, the flow is somehow transverse to the leaves. Of course, the leaves could be moving around as we, as we walk around the solid torus, but approximately this is, this is the case. So you end up with a picture like this. These big, bold dots are now corresponding to fixed points of, our, of my map. And these other uh, uh, leaves, uh, you have the flow transverse to them here. So, so now I'd like to apply this to the situation that we actually have a twist. So now we say, supposing we have a map, with, uh, as I said, that there's a, that you're moving infinitesimally in a different direction around the origin, which is a fixed point to on the boundary. And now we say, OK, supposing we have one of these uh, fillings by surfaces of section that I just described. And let me just draw the transverse slice of these fillings. To, it's easier to, to draw, you see. So. <clears throat> Supposing that this, 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 this foliation actually contains uh, this particular fixed point at the origin, then, I mean, um, this, is, this is not rigorous, but I'm saying supposing locally around there, it, the, the leaves are meeting in this fashion here. This just uh, coming in all directions. And supposing on the boundary, the leaves are coming out like this. So we'd like to conclude somehow that the structure of this uh, foliation is rich enough that we can conclude two more fixed points. Right? So worst possible scenario is that it's just boring and the leaves do this. They just go from the in to the out. And I don't get nothing. 
Well, then, of course, that means that the flow has to be transverse to all these leaves on the interior. So in some sense, the flow is either moving counterclockwise or clockwise, whichever. But then, of course, we're assuming that there's a twist, right? So the flow is transverse in different directions near the boundary and near to the interior. So we have a problem. So this can't happen. So clearly, all the leaves that start off at the origin cannot connect to the boundary. So there has to be something extra in the foliation that prevents this, something getting in the way. So we would like to conclude two fixed points, so let me try and assume that we can get away with this with just one. So maybe something like this. We have one, and we have a, a leaf, a curve that closes around, and then I haven't filled in the rest of the picture, but somehow imagine that the rest of the curves are then prevented from going to the boundary by this other ring in the middle. OK, then I'm still not done, because I've only got one fixed point besides the origin. <coughs> but then if we think about it, of course, this leaf is also a surface of section in the solid three in the solid torus. So again, the flow has to pr pr move strictly outwards or strictly inwards. We don't know which. Let's say it's outwards. And that would mean that the whole region enclosed by this circle would end up, when I come back again, in a region with strictly greater area. So we have a problem. So there has to be a little bit more in there, and there has to be at least one more fixed point so that there's now sort of two windows, one on which the vectors can move out and one on which the flow can move uh, inwards. Um, and so we get our two fixed points, and you can make that rigorous. Um, this is what the rest of the foliation could look like. I mean, of course, there could well be many more fixed points, but that is how it could look like the rest of the leaves. Um, now, <clears throat> of course, this actually only works if you have a f one of these foliations. And so it works, uh, which you do have generically. So if you took a, uh, a dense set, there's a dense set in the, c in the smooth topology on the space of uh, air preserving diffeomorphisms from the disk. And you can find, set all this up, and you can obtain this, and you can get the two fixed points. Um, now, Poincaré's statement is not closed under limits, right? If you, so you can't conclude from the true, if the statement's true for a generic map that it's true for, for all error-preserving maps because the two fixed points could collide. Nevertheless, if you apply this argument and you keep track of this obstacle in the middle, these two red curves, then you can take a limit with those and then you can get any error-preserving diffeomorphism and you get, again, still at least two fixed points. So this is really using Gromov's compactness. Uh, theorem. So before then, we really only used sort of topological properties of these sections that the vectors are strictly transverse. Eventually, to do that, take a limit, then you really need to know if there's, a, there's analysis behind that and actually use Gromov compactness to get the full, the full story. Um, so everything I just said, more or less, did not, I mean, apart from when I actually tried to prove there are two fixed points, um, the whole existence of these uh, surfaces of section filling up the space, that does not require there to be a twist at all. So you could hope maybe if you can construct these, maybe you can apply these to other situations. And it turns out there are, <clears throat> there are a great many of these uh, foliations by surfaces of section. As I said, if you take a typical three manifold with a, let's say, a contact three manifold, you don't know there even exists a single surface of section coming from a pseudomorphic curve. Um, but in the particular, this particularly nice case where the flow is really two-dimensional because of the way we constructed it, then you can find them. And in fact, you can pick any homology class on the boundary, and you can make sure your leaves meet that homology class. You can pick any single one periodic orbit and ensure that that is a periodic orbit in the boundary of one of your curves, or an asymptotic orbit. And you can also do this for um, uh, uh, sort of coverings of these, uh, uh, these mapping tori and so on. So there's, there's uh, infinitely many of these that are not just uh, trivially related. So there's a, a priori lot of information here. So we construct, if, we, if you have this, then we just observe that it's very easy to go from there to say, well, if I happen to have a twist at the origin, then there's also two fixed points. But uh, what about in general? So there are a number of things you can do, and I'll just mention one that just just because it relates to the notion of a twist. So <clears throat> you might ask, so OK, if I have a, an error-preserving map um, on the disk, 
um, let's say, generalize our notion of a twist map to be not just that there's the fixed point is at the origin and there's a little twist in some direction compared to the boundary, but that there is some fixed point somewhere on the interior such that infinitesimally you have this rotation in a different direction to the boundary. And then, of course, if you took a typical map at random, it would have a twist because this is, uh, you could just give a little perturbation to anything if it wasn't and you would have a twist or at least, uh, at least for some iterate. So how about if you don't allow yourself to take these perturbations and you just say, I'm just given any smooth error preserving disk map. Is there any way to say which ones have a twist in some sense and which ones don't? So clearly, so what are the ones that clearly don't? Well, clearly the identity map doesn't have a twist. And, and more generally, any map which has a finite iterate is the identity, clearly doesn't have a twist. Um, <clears throat> another, another, another class of maps of the disk, error-preserving maps of the disk that clearly don't have a twist are those that have only one fixed point and no other periodic points. Because if that one fixed point was a twist, Poincaré's theorem would tell you there were many more periodic points, and we're just assuming there's not, and these do exist. For example, irrational rotations, but they're also more interesting ergodic examples. And these maps clearly don't have a twist. So there's two classes of maps here that clearly don't have a twist, those that are roots of unity and those that have a single periodic point. And it turns out all the others do have a twist if you allow yourself to take an iterate. So the reason for this I, I won't explain, but it comes down to the fact that we observed in the, in the proof earlier that we found, in our proof of Poincaré's question, we found that these two extra fixed points came from the fact that we had a, a foliation here which had this structure on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, all the leaves are kind of tree-like. You could, uh, they, they don't have this sort of topology that you have on the right-hand side. We actually have a closed, uh, a closed chain of, of leaves. So a twist kind of implies this picture, and it turns out that actually the converse is also true. <clears throat> if you have this picture, you also have a twist. So you can use this, that cycles are equivalent to twists, to prove the statement I just said, which is that every smooth orientation preserving, error preserving map of the disk uh, is one of the following. Either it has precisely one periodic point, or it's a root of unity, or there's some iterate that has an interior fixed point about which the motion is infinitesimally in a different direction to the boundary. Of course, to make that rigorous, you have to speak of covering maps and so on, but intuitively, that's clear. So, uh, and then uh, there are other things one can do and uh, with, with, with this, uh, this structure that's there, and I won't talk about those now, um, but uh, I will we'll, uh, stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, remarks? Does this proof work for continuous map, or, or do you assume smoothness? Uh, I assume uh, smoothness, yes. OK. Yes. Yes. Yes, right, yeah, yeah, thank you, yes. So uh, Patrice LaCalvez, and very interestingly, in a, from a, not using pseudomorphic curves at all, comes up with um, a, a picture very similar to this. So he f shows that there's a singular one-dimensional foliation if you have only a continuous error-preserving or measure-preserving map on um, uh, a sphere or a disk. And um, uh, this doesn't have a, uh, he doesn't associate it with a mapping torus, Instead, he has a picture like this, and he shows that given, uh, uh, given a point, and then the point that the transformation takes it to, you can find an arc that is then connects these two that is transverse to every leaf in his singular foliation. And with this, he was able to prove very strong results for continuous error preserving maps. And he came through this not through considering PDEs, but by a generalization of the Brouwer uh, plane trans, uh, translation theorem. So that's very interesting. He ends up with, uh, with these, with these uh, one-dimensional foliations with this transverse property from this point of view. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, just a, a, as there is some time, maybe you could take yes. five minutes to explain where, where, where the foliation comes from, from this holomorphic disk. Is it possible? Ah, <laughs> uh, sure. 
So, um, right, so, <clears throat> so, um, so the foliations come from, maybe I go back a second to this picture of the mapping torus. So, so here we are, so here. So really, if you take a, uh, maybe this picture. So here we have a three-dimensional space. <clears throat> if you cross with this with the real line, you have a non-compact four-dimensional space, and you can equip this with, a, with an almost complex structure that is invariant in, the R, in this direction, in the, the, the R coordinate in this four-dimensional space. So now, um, where these leaves come from uh, in here is these are uh, the projection of surfaces that live in this four-dimensional space that you just project down into uh, the three-dimensional space here. And these surfaces, if you can show that they are embedded upstairs and have the property that when you shift them up and down, they don't intersect themselves, then it, this corresponds downstairs into them having this transversality property. There's also an energy condition that has to be, the finite energy condition has to be satisfied. And in some sense, this is very like, uh, I mean, <clears throat> these curves are very much like uh, negative gradient flows. I mean, so it's sort of, I mean, these come historically from uh, the variational principle for which these uh, periodic orbits come from. Um, so in, that, in hindsight, there's, there's a lot of natural links, even though it's such a uh, difficult, uh, you know, amazing concept to have, to have come up with. Um, and these come from, the, so then where do the leaves in the four-dimensional space come from? Well, these, unlike the dynamics, are actually very stable under perturbation. So you can start off with a flow on the solid torus that is not the one you're interested in, but as simple as possible, for example, in an irrational rotation. And then you find by hand a foliation by, uh, by, the, by, by these uh, holomorphic curves. And then you can homotope all the data, so that means the, the vector field, and there's the background symplectic structure uh, from this model situation to the situation you're interested in. And when you do this, uh, you can carry over all the information, all, the, all these leaves that you started off with, and at some point, sort of in some sense at the last minute, everything can kind of break up. And you started off with a picture that's actually rather simple, there's just a single uh, binding orbit going through the center, and just leaves going round. It's really an, an open book at that point. But in the, the final picture you end up with is much richer, and you end up with potentially a whole collection of these uh, uh, periodic orbits. And that's roughly where um, this comes from. And this was a technique discovered by Hoffer, Wazowski, and Zainder, like I uh, said in the, uh, the 90s. And they did this for the situation where instead of having a solid torus, you have a three-dimensional sphere. And you have um, a certain kind of, uh, this is sort of like a, a, an energy surface of a, a certain kind of Hamiltonian uh, on, on, uh, on uh, an ambient symplectic manifold. And uh, they were constructed fully, uh, a filling of the three sphere by surfaces transverse to, these ve to, the, to the vector field they were interested in. And they got uh, uh, marvelous uh, results out of this. In that situation where the flow is genuinely three dimensional, unlike here, it's, uh, they could really only construct one foliation. Here, because you really have something that's coming from a two-dimensional situation, uh, you can actually construct infinitely many, and uh, there's, there's more to play around with. So perhaps you can also, in, for the three-sphere, um, but that's presumably harder. And um, uh, so is that helpful, maybe? Maybe a bit more, yeah. Thank you. More, more questions? Remarks? So if not, we thank the speaker again. Yeah,